Today's interview is from July 28th, 2011. It is with Aubrey de Grey. Aubrey de Grey back in 2011 was not nearly as well known as he is now. Aubrey de Grey works on uh, solving the problem of human aging, and he had been featured on 60 Minutes years back. That's how we originally heard of him. And he, since this interview, of course, has become far more well known. He has been back on our program several times, including during the last year. He recently did a Reddit Ask Me Anything, and he is really um, uh, getting so much more attention for the work that he is doing. So let's first play the interview, and then after I'll tell you about some of the feedback that we got, some of the interesting reaction to this, uh, this appearance. Joining us from Cambridge, England is Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's a biomedical gerontologist. Uh, Aubrey, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. I've been following your work ever since the 60 Minutes piece. I think it was back in 2006, and I'm pretty interested by it. And you do a lot of work about aging and the idea that aging is basically something that can be controlled and that doesn't have to happen the way it's basically been accepted for as long as humans have been on Earth. Tell me a little bit about how you first got into this line of work. Well, I've really known since my earliest days, I can't even think how soon, that aging was in some sense obviously something that was first of all obviously bad for us and secondly um, potentially amenable to medical intervention. And I went through my childhood and youth and, and indeed until I was about 30 uh, really not appreciating at all that this was an unpopular view and that actually most people were much more fatalistic about aging. I had completely presumed that biologists agreed with me that this was their most important thing to work on and that lots and lots of them were actually working on it. And of course, one never heard about much progress, but I never really thought about that, you know, because obviously it's a hard problem and therefore progress was going to be fitful. And so, you know, you don't talk about that very much, but you don't talk about the color of the sky very much either. So, you know, it's not really a particularly informative fact. So I guess the, the real epiphany for me was around the age of 30 when, by virtue of conversations with my wife, who is a biologist and who I'd met a few years previously, um, and with people, other, other biologists that I'd met through her, I began to appreciate that actually most biologists did not regard aging as particularly important or even as particularly interesting. And so eventually I despaired of um, changing their minds about this and decided that there was nothing for it but to try and do it myself. And so I switched fields from computer science, which was my original training. So to, to the average person, I think the idea that aging can be controlled in, in, a, in a very straightforward way would be a, a new idea. And I know you could speak for hours about this, but to the newcomer to this type of, of line of thought, What's the simple explanation that you have as to how and why aging can be controlled, as you say? Well, of course, I'm certainly not saying that it can be controlled today. I'm saying that we are within striking distance of developing therapies which will be able to control it in the future. And, of course, as with any new technology of any kind, whether medical or otherwise, we don't know how soon it's going to be before those technologies are actually developed. I would say there's a 50% chance of getting there within the next 25 years or so. Now, what sort of technologies are we talking about here? Essentially, we can describe that in just two words. It's regenerative medicine. In other words, it's repairing the various types of molecular and cellular damage that accumulate throughout life as side effects of normal metabolism, of the normal operation of the human body. Um, those side effects, because they accumulate, they're eventually harmful. They eventually get in the way of our metabolism and cause the diseases and disabilities of old age, even though until that time, because they're less abundant, they are essentially harmless. What's the so nitty we, gritty? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what's the nitty gritty of what would a treatment like this look like? In other words, you go into a medical office, presumably, and you're given a liquid, some kind of injection. I mean, literally, what would it be like? The first thing to say in answer to that is it's probably going to change a lot over time because the actual delivery of these therapies is something that can be progressively refined. Initially, for example, it may involve extensive amounts of surgery to replace whole organs, and as time goes on, we may be able to eliminate that aspect and do things purely at the more microscopic, cellular and molecular level. Um, however, in, uh, apart from that, one can say that it's really not going to be all that much different from the sort of 
way that we deliver medicine today. So in, you mentioned injections. Injections are going to be a big part of it. In general, stem cell therapy today, in the somewhat experimental and limited form that it already exists, is done mostly by injections, by simply preparing cells into the right state and then in, introducing them into the circulation, um, and then they just go to the right place and do what we want them to do. The same is largely true in the case of gene therapy. We prepare DNA, typically packaged into engineered viruses, and again, we inject that into the bloodstream, and it just goes and does its thing. So, yeah, injections is the biggest part of it, though it's not the whole thing. You mentioned stem cell research, and this is interesting because it's something we talk about on this program quite a bit. And in the U.S., as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of resist political resistance to stem cell research for reasons typically relating to religion. Are we to expect the same type of resistance, and it may be different, you know, on your side of the Atlantic Ocean than ours, are we to expect similar type of resistance to, to some of the research you're doing? The situation in relation to aging is very different from the situation that has been so prevalent in the U.S. in relation to stem cell research. What's going on in the U.S. in relation to stem cell research is very, very circumscribed, very narrowly defined. In, it's all about embryonic stem cells, and the focus of it all has been about the way in which those cells are prepared, the way they're created, namely the fact that creating them has involved the destruction of very early embryos. So if one believes, for religious reasons, that those early embryos are already human beings in a real sense, you know, with a soul and all those sorts of things, then one's clearly going to be a little upset about the idea of destroying those embryos for medical purposes, just as one would be about destroying an adult for medical purposes. Um, and of course, whether or not the five-day-old embryo, which is what is destroyed in the preparation of those stem cells, is actually a human being. That's not something that can be answered by scientific means, though there are certain items of scientific evidence that can be set um, on one or other side of that argument. Um, but the good thing is that it's only a matter of the way in which those cells are created. In other words, if we develop a new way to create the same type of cells, then we're done. And we're essentially sidestepping and avoiding that whole issue. But and let's that, say, course, hy is, is, hypothetically... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, yeah. hang on, hang on. Because it's very important to remember that this is exactly what has happened. Just a few years ago now, four or five years ago, a group in Japan developed a way to take normal adult cells and turn them into cells that behave pretty much exactly like embryonic stem cells. Lots of other labs all over the world are doing the same thing now. So that whole issue has gone away. But I want to answer your original question much more, more directly, because you asked, is aging going to actually go the same way and i think that certainly there is like to be a whole bunch of opposition to research to control aging as there already is in fact from a whole bunch of quarters including religious quarters but it's not going to be the same sort of resistance it's going to be resistance based on the consequences of these of success in developing these therapies rather than based on the methods for actually implementing them I think there will be both, because I, I want to get to some of the consequences you're mentioning, but I can completely imagine having a sense of the what we call the religious right here in the U.S., that they would say, a thousand-year-old person, which we'll get to, I know we haven't mentioned that yet, that's not what God wanted. And of course, there's no way for us to know what God did or didn't want, but I, I, would, I am sure that we would hear that. Now, the consequences you're mentioning would be along the lines of the financial overpopulation, ethical questions, right? And, and my understanding... Well, no. Okay, so no, no. I, I consider the creation of any people a thousand years old as one of the consequences. I'm still talking here about the results of the therapies, not the therapies themselves. Okay. Just remember that I don't actually work on longevity. I don't work on longevity. I work on keeping people healthy, stopping them from getting sick. In other words, I'm only focused on the diseases and disabilities of old age. If we actually were to be able to postpone indefinitely those diseases and disabilities so that people stayed in a truly youthful, healthy state, whether mentally or physically, as long as they lived, then it's very likely that there would be a consequence of that, a side effect, which is that people would live a great deal longer. But that's a consequence. It's not the purpose of this work. You've said in 2008 and more recently that you think the first human who will live up to a thousand years is, is probably already alive now. They may even yes. be 50 or 60 years old today. Can you explain wh how you came to that conclusion, first of all? And am I right in inferring that that suggests within the next 20 years there will be significant developments along these lines? 
You got it, exactly. I think that the chances are good, perhaps 50-50 or more, that within the next, I'd say, 25 years, we will develop regenerative medicine to control aging to a degree that I would think of as decisive, to a degree where we are postponing the onset of age-related ill health by more than a year per year. In other words, we are keeping people treading water, so to speak, from a health, from an age point, from a biological age point of view. And so long as we get to that point, which I've been calling longevity escape velocity, and we maintain it, we will be uh, helping people, we will be allowing people to avoid the ill health of old age, however long they live. Now, Ages like a thousand come really, they're pretty arbitrary, but they come from calculating how long people would live on average if they maintained throughout their life, however long they lived, the same risk of death each year that we see today in the Western world for young adults. If you get to the age of, let's say, 26 today, then your chance of not getting to 27, if you're living in a reasonably affluent part of the Western world, is very low. It's around one in a thousand or less. So that means clearly that if you continue to have that risk of death each year, every year, however long you live, then on average you're going to live a four-digit lifespan. That's just straightforward mathematics. Of course, it is pretty arbitrary as, a predict as predictions go because the actual risk of death will depend on what happens in terms of other technologies that may influence uh, risks of death from causes other than aging things like accidents, for example. And those things may very well change rather rapidly as time goes on. In fact, they may change rather more rapidly than our risk of death from aging. So actually, these numbers are really just completely arbitrary, and that's really why I don't really like to talk about them very much. But people constantly ask me, how long, how long could we live with these therapies? And I have to give some kind of straight answer. Sure. And, and I don't, again, I think the idea here is, would this fundamentally change our outlook on life? Because I'm thinking, if I knew that I had the potential to, instead of living, I don't know, 70 to 90 years that potentially I could live. I mean, forget about a thousand. Let's just say 400 or 500 years. Am I not going to say, you know what? The risk of getting hit by a car seems like it would take away a lot more years than than it would. Am I not going to live my life differently? I think there's a lot of truth in that. And indeed, the first thing that I predicted when I started thinking about all this, which was more than a decade ago now, was indeed that, age, that driving would actually be outlawed. Uh, because it is too dangerous. It kills people other than the driver rather too often. Uh, but actually, I, I moved forward somewhat in my thinking since that time. And my belief these days is actually that, by and large, we're just going to throw money at these problems. We're going to make risky activities less risky just by building you know, things like very, very safe cars uh, that are simply not going to kill people, even in the case of severe human error. Um, you know, these are things that we can do already if we could be bothered, but we don't prioritize them because at the moment only a very small minority of people die of, of car accidents in the first place. You get the idea. Absolutely. In the last couple of minutes we have left, can you talk a little bit about the financial aspect in the sense that when these treatments become available initially, would they just be available to those who have the most money? Would they be guinea pigged on people who have the least money? What can we expect to happen? I'm quite sure that these therapies will be available to everybody who's old enough to need them very, very shortly after they become available to anybody. And the reason for that is straightforward economics. Unlike today's high-tech medicine, which simply you spend a lot of money on keeping people alive in a bad state of health for a little longer than they otherwise would, and you just spend more money on them than you otherwise would, unlike that, in this case, this medicine is going to pay for itself because it's going to keep people in a good state of health where they could continue to contribute wealth to society rather than just consuming wealth. And, of course, whereby their loved ones are not going to have a loss of productivity by virtue of looking after their frail elderly parents and so on. So, actually, it's going to be economically suicidal for any country not to make these therapies available free, um, irrespective of ability to pay, to anyone who's old enough to need them, even in tax-averse places like the USA. You can think of basic education as a good precedent for, this, for how this is going to work. It's fascinating work. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is the Chief Science Officer at the SENS Foundation. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and I look forward to speaking to you again. My pleasure. So after Aubrey de Grey was on for the first time, we received a flood of messages from people. And interestingly, many people were arguing, there were kind of two camps. 
of those who did not really agree or believe in what Aubrey de Grey was talking about solving the problem of aging. One group just didn't believe that it was possible, right? They just said flat out scientifically, this will never happen. This is not possible. People will not live to many hundreds or a thousand years old. Not going to happen. Another group said, I don't really care whether or not it will be possible. I just don't think it will be really good. If you have the potential to live that long, individual experiences become increasingly meaningless. Everything becomes far less meaningful if you have the potential to live that long, which is not really a theory that I subscribe to now. And Aubrey de Grey has been back on the show several times since we've talked about the moral and other implications of what he's talking about. And I think it's interesting to go back and see that first interview that he did and remembering the feedback and the reaction that we got. If your views have changed, if you've been following Aubrey de Grey's work for a while and your views have, have evolved about what he's working on, definitely let us know. Leave us voicemail 219 to David P. What do you think about the work Aubrey de Grey is doing?